Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Uche Kennedy and this is Study with Kennedy. In today's video, we are going to be looking at how to study pathology. And I'm going to be looking at how to study pathology at three different levels. Okay, the first point is going to be for the student that is about to go into pathology. So you are in MD2, depending on your school, you may be taking pathology at different points. But most of the time, in my school, for example, we started taking pathology from MD2. So if you're from MD3, rather, as of when I was there, I don't know if it has changed. So if you're going into the class where you're going to study pathology, you are on a holiday, you have a break, something of that nature. You are going to be the first group of students I'm going to be speaking to. The second group of students I'm going to be speaking to will be students who are already taking pathology. So the first group of students will be people who are yet to take pathology. The second group of students will be people who are already taking pathology, already in the class for pathology, already learning pathology. And the third group of students I will be addressing this video to will be those who are already at the point of taking the USMLE. So the timestamps are going to be down in the description. You're going to be able to click to the chapters. So depending on where you are at, you may want to just skip to your portion of the video. Otherwise, you can watch the entire video. It's going to be helpful to you either way. Now, if you are yet to study pathology, the most important thing for you is going to be what resources should I use to study pathology, right? What resources? You're looking for resources, you're trying to gather materials to use. These are the resources I would recommend. And again, this is for people that are yet to study pathology. You have a month before you start. You have two months before you start. You have a week before you start. Number one is the Robbins textbook the robbins textbook and when i say the robbins textbook i don't mean the biggest robbins textbook okay not the biggest robbins textbook in fact i'm going to find the specific the specific robbins textbook i'm talking about the robbins textbook medium i think it's what it's called robbins basic Pathology. I'll show you the image for that book so that you can look at it. Okay, so when I say the Robbins textbook, this is what I'm talking about. This was the specific book I used. This book is not as big, this one right here, right? This one right here. It's not as big as the biggest Robbins textbook that we all know, but it is not also the smallest Robbins textbook. It's like in between. Robbins Basic Pathology, that book. Robbins Basic pathology not this book not the pathologic basis of diseases no not the pathologic basis of diseases but robin's basic pathology again it's the same authors but it's like a sized down version of the book this is the book i used during med school okay i read this book during the holiday before school resumed so before school resumed i had covered three four five chapters of the book already and done questions in advance right so if you're yet to study pathology you're on a holiday you're preparing to take pathology as a course get the robbins basic pathology book read that book make notes make annotations have sticky notes my robbins basic pathology is like my most it's my favorite book of all the books i used during med school if you can do that you will be well on your way to doing to performing very well basically on your exam right so robin's basic pathology robin's textbook the second thing i'm going to recommend to you if you are yet to study pathology is going to be the kaplan lectures the kaplan lectures now we have a lot of resources that you are privy to as a medical student right there are lots of videos there is patoma there are all these videos most of them are short precise straight to the point blah 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 but I'll tell you something that is unique about the Kaplan lectures. Apart from the fact that the specific teacher that taught the pathology in Kaplan was actually incredibly good, I would give it that. I would give that to him. But the lectures are more detailed. They are longer. They are more detailed. You're going to be able to understand fully whatever it is you're looking to do. So the Kaplan lectures is going to be useful. That is what I used when I was in med school. Even if people used other alternatives, but I felt like these set the foundation perfectly well for what I was preparing for at the time. From here onwards, if you're already studying pathology, you are already studying pathology, meaning that your teacher is already teaching. You are trying to read to catch up to your teacher, right? So this was for people that are yet to study pathology. Now, if you already study pathology, 
You are already in class. You did not study during the holiday. You go to school and when your teacher teaches you, that is the first time you are learning the information for the most part. Now, what resources do I recommend? Patoma. If you are already studying pathology, you are already taking the classes, you are behind, you are catch, playing catch up with your teacher, Patoma is the book for you. You don't have enough time any longer to go read the Robin's textbook, right? That ship kind of have sailed. Some of you can still try if you're a very fast reader and you love reading textbooks. You can still try with the Robin's textbook. Otherwise, you can stick with Patoma or other resources um, that they have on pathology. I don't, I don't know all the names of all the resources currently. But Patoma was a very good one at the time. There is the cartoonish ones. You can put names of resources down in the comments so that everybody can learn. Other students can see resources. I have people asking me all the time about resources. Please, if you know all the other resources that have helped you, don't hesitate to put them in the comments so that will help other students as well. But Patoma is probably your go-to place if you're already studying pathology. Patoma is also your go-to place if you're preparing for the USML. Okay? Patoma is also your go-to place if you're preparing for the USML. Now, along with Patoma, along with Patoma, you want to practice questions. This is for those of you that are already studying pathology. You want to practice questions. At the end of the day, questions are what will help you master the subject. If you study, 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 that is good. You should study at least once. Go through the resource at least once. And after that, practice questions. If you are studying pathology in school right now, I wouldn't recommend that you start doing the UWord questions. You don't want to start with the UWord questions. Instead, you want to start with other question sources. And I will show you other question sources you can use. Okay? I will show you other question sources you can use. Number one is the Robbins question book. The question book for the Robins, and this is what I'm talking about right here. You see these books, they now come in different, they have various back book covers and whatever, but it doesn't matter. Robins and Contran Review of Pathology. Look at this. Robins and Contran Review of Pathology. They have different back covers, it's the same thing. Some are newer editions, some are older editions. It doesn't matter to me, it's almost the same question. This is the specific one. I used when I was in med school. The reddish one you see down here is the specific one I used during med school. Robbins and Cultural Review of Pathology do the questions in this book as if, and know them better than you know your name, is what I tell my students. Do those questions and know them better than you know your name. If you're taking pathology already, do those questions every single chapter. Practice them, master them, know them. The second place you can practice questions from, the second place you can get questions from is going to be from WebPath. I don't know how WebPath is not very popular among students, but for some reason, a lot of people do not actually know about WebPath. But I'm going to take you guys here and I'm going to show you what WebPath look like. You just type, basically type WebPath on your browser and you're going to have this come up, okay? The name is... It's just that web part. Do you see that? Okay, they are going to give you, they're going to show you examinations in pathology. You click on examinations in pathology, they'll bring you to something like this, and you're going to have all of these. You can choose organ system pathology, you can choose general and special topics in pathology, you can pick general and organ pathology quizzes and all of that. There are lots of different question sets here. Now, for most of you, you're going to do organ system pathology. If you click on it, this is what web part looks like. So let's say we click cardiovascular and one of the things you will notice is that they have lots of questions. They are not just 10 questions, right? Here you see questions 1 to 40, 27, 45 questions, 55 questions. It's a lot of questions. It's a whole queue back if you ask me. So you pick cardiovascular pathology. Um, 63 year old man with knife-like pain radiating to the back. Okay, let's say that, um, let's just kill the chaotic dissection. You pick it, they're going to tell you. Correct. This is classic um, history of aortic dissection. Da, 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 da. We are not here to do um, practice questions, so I'm not, I don't want to waste your time with this. But they'll give you the, the explanation. That's what I'm 
talking about here, right? They'll give you the explanation. It's very short. It's not similar to what you have on you all, but it is something, right? And if you click on all the other options, when part will tell you it's incorrect, they'll kind of tell you why it's incorrect. If you click on it, they'll kind of tell you why it's incorrect. They'll tell you why it's incorrect, why it's incorrect. And you can learn from here, right? You can learn from here. So web part is the other very important place you're going to get questions from. The other, one other place you can get questions from is going to be by random Google search. Now, I will show you something. When you study a particular, um, a particular subject, right? Say you're studying... Um, and we are doing cardiovascular system. Say so you're studying cardiovascular system. You want to go on Google and just type infective endocarditis, for example. Infective endocarditis. And at the end of it, you want to put USMLE. Now, if you type infective endocarditis and you put USMLE, one of the first things that is going to come up is going to be med bullets. Okay? You see, med bullets come up here and they show you endocarditis. Usually, they will have step two and three, but if you look just below or so, you're going to see the one for step one. Because... I tend to look up more step two things. Maybe I'll have step two or three. You know what I'm talking about. But look for the med bullets. Click on it. Endocarditis cardiovascular. Look at that. They bring you to this page. And they always start out every page with a question or a vignette. Okay? A classic presentation. Look at this. A 50-year-old man presents in the emergency room for a fever that has persisted for several days. He denies any history of IV drug use or congenital heart disease. Physical exam reviews, splinter hemorrhages, ulcers node, Janeway lesions. Now, what they try to do with these vignettes at the top of the page is they try to give you the classic presentation. The most obvious way a person with endocarditis is going to present. Infective endocarditis is going to present. And that kind of it kind of sets your mind up, right? It keeps your mind on um, ready to know what this patient should look like. And for every disease you study, take note of this, for every disease you study, you have to ask yourself how a classic patient with that condition is going to present. If, does that make sense? So if you're studying myocardial infarction, how will a classic patient with myocardial infarction present? It's going to be an... A man in his 40s, 50s, woman in her 60s, maybe, presenting with what? Chest pain, substantial chest pain, very important, right? Feels like crushing pain, radiating to the jaw or the left shoulder, something like that. That is going to be classic presentation for myocardial infarction. Or if someone has aortic stenosis, you're looking for shortness of breath syncope. Right, chest pain, shortness of breast syncope. You know that is classic presentation for aortic stenosis. So similarly, when you are studying endocarditis, infective endocarditis, you type infective endocarditis USMLE. They bring you straight to this med bullet page. You come on this med bullet page. You read this vignette up here. Look at how they put, they crafted this vignette. This is the classic presentation of a patient with infective endocarditis. You want to put it in your mind. Most of your actual vignettes are not going to obviously tell you genuinely the religions or slash no, no, they're not going to do that. But you want to at least understand what a classic vignette is going to look like and kind of know it, right? In the past, when you read the page, at the bottom, they usually have a few questions. I don't know if they still do. It's been a very long time I looked at these things. Um, okay, I can't, I can't see any questions here. But MedBullet would usually have questions at the bottom of some of their um, subjects that they cover, right? I think they probably still do with some other subjects. Let's click here. The question is under review will be available later. Okay, so I think for some of the subjects, you're actually going to get questions on that subject, right? Sometimes they put the questions there. Again, it's going to give you room to practice. So, three places you can find questions to do. Number one is the Robbins Q-Bank. Number two is web part. Number three is med bullet the fourth place or the fourth thing you can do to get questions to practice what i'm giving you guys is based on where we are at in the world currently i want to show you guys all the ways you can improve your studies all the way you can improve your lectures and all of that okay and i think i'm going to take you guys a little bit into this place uh, give me one second here. Okay. The other thing you can do is use chat GPT. And I'll show you how chat GPT can be useful for you. Okay. 
I'll show you how ChatGPT can be useful for you. Now, when you look at this page, I'll bring it here so that you guys can see the entire screen. When you open ChatGPT, a lot of students don't know that this is something you can do. And you tell ChatGPT, make me 10 USMLE, oops, USMLE style questions. on cardiovascular system for step one okay you can put a prompt in chat gpt and ask chat gpt to make you usmle questions for step one style questions and you chat gpt is going to make you questions look at this in real time ChatGPT is creating questions for us. So a lot of students are going to say, oh, but I don't want to buy UWorld. I'm just an MD3. You don't have to buy UWorld. ChatGPT is going to make you questions like this. Look at this. It's still going on and on and on. This is question seven, question eight. Now, what I find is that some of these questions are not necessarily the best, absolute best questions that you can get, but they are very, very good. If you can answer all these questions, you are going places already. Look at this. We have already 10 solid questions on cardiovascular systems. There are a lot that could come out of this. I would leave all of those for some other time. Now, you can ask ChatGPT. Please give me answers. Give me answers. Give, I can't spell, right? Can I? Give answers with detailed explanation. Look at this. You can tell ChatGPT to give you answers with detailed explanation. And there you go. It gives you the answers to those questions and it gives you the explanation to those questions as well. So you can ask ChatGPT to give you the questions. It will give, you can ask ChatGPT to make you a hundred questions. It will make you a hundred questions. You do them or 50 questions. You do them. You ask ChatGPT for the answers with explanations. You mark yourself. You see how you perform and you are really indeed good to go. I hope this is making sense. So we've seen four places now that we can get questions from. We are talking about AI. You should use AI to your advantage. This is one of the ways you can use AI to your advantage. I hope this is making sense. And these are for students that are already in pathology class. You can use the Patoma book. And then you have all of these question sources available to you. The Robbins question book was what I used in med school. When I was in med school, I did the Robbins question book. I did web parts. I used MedBullet. There was no chat GPT available to us. I did some U Word offline as well, but I don't think that that is necessary for you to do. That's not a recommendation here. Now, for the students that are studying for the USMLE, you are preparing for the USMLE. You have six months to prepare, right? You have six months. And in all of this, I, I forgot to mention, by the way, whether you are already pre um, studying pathology, you are yet to study pathology, or you are at the USMLE level, one of the books you must have is your first aid, okay? If you're a US directed medical student, you're going towards going to the US and doing the USMLEs, you should have a first aid at all levels. Always reference your first aid, right? So as you're doing all these questions, you're going to be learning some new things. Annotate your first aid. A hard copy first aid will be fantastic. If you have a soft copy on a tablet, you have a pen like this one where you can just write, annotate, do that. That's also incredible. Or if not, then at least have a copy of the first aid somewhere on your phone or something. And reference it often because that is the Bible of your USML. Okay? Now, for the USML students, what resources should you be looking at if you're preparing for the USMLE? Patoma is still a very good resource to have. The reason why Patoma is recommended for these two levels is that Patoma is pretty short, right? It's easier to go through. You can cover the material in a short amount of time. So go through your Patoma, and of course, you should do your world. Now, depending on your level as a student, your world may be what you go to straight or you may need to do the Robbins question book before you world. When I work with students preparing them for the USMLE, I often ask them to do chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Robbins question book. 
these chapters will cover general pathology. So if I have a student prepare for the USMLE, I would first have them do those chapters in the Robbins book before they do a block of general pathology on UWorld. The idea is that you should have your foundation solid. If you want to have a good run through pathology, especially when you're preparing for your US money and you want to save yourself time, you want your basics to be as solid as possible. Okay, you want to cover those general pathology concepts and make sure you have them nailed down. Does this make sense? So, Robin's question book chapters one, two, three, four, and seven practice those questions know them better than you know your name and then go on to do general pathology in new world and then for the systems you can just do the systems directly from new world because you has hundreds of questions usually on every system that you can practice for general pathology you does not have hundreds of questions i think they have about two blocks or one block or something like that so that is important usmla students pathology and patoma new world is good for you if you don't like patoma you have another but some beyond all the other millions of resources you guys have you can also use them no problems but you have to use your UWorld, and of course you have to have a copy of the first aid you have to absolutely use your first aid when you study now that we've had we have that covered i'm going to take you through general concepts you should bear in mind when studying pathology at whatever level you are at for everybody that is studying pathology i'll call this general this is something you should bear in mind number one is nomenclature in pathology diseases are often named according to their pathophysiology meaning that the name of the disease tells you many times what the disease is about now there are names that don't Unless you know the origin of the name, it probably wouldn't make any sense to you. Like if I say what is psoriasis, as an English speaker, psoriasis means nothing. Psoriasis is just psoriasis, right? Because I've studied medicine, okay, psoriasis is this disease that affects the, that causes people to have silvery, scaly plaques on the elbow and extensor surfaces, whatever, right? But the word psoriasis doesn't tell me anything. However, the word polycythemia, vera. When I ask some students, give me what's the pathophysiology of polycythemia vera, and you're thinking you don't know what you find in the disease, you don't know how the disease should look like. Look at the name, polycythemia. Excess poly is multiple, cyte is cells, amia is blood, right? Multiple or a lot of cells in the blood. So polycythemia vera is a condition in which you have a lot of cells in the blood. Now, if you understand the disease already, you know, okay, there are mostly red blood cells, platelets, basophils, whatever, right? But you just know from the name that, okay, this is what this disease is about. If I say, okay, liver cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis, somebody is going to say, oh, I don't know. No. What is cirrhosis? Cirrhosis sounds like what? Fibrosis. So liver fibrosis, meaning liver in liver cirrhosis, you're going to technically have fibrosis of the liver. Now, it's one thing to know the name, and of course, you can look up the pathophysiology and all of that. But what I'm giving you here is when you look at the name of diseases, try to see if the name tells you something about the disease. There are some diseases that have alternative names that don't tell us anything, like um, especially those diseases that are named after people. When you learn a disease that is named after somebody, like, um, what, what example can I give you guys here? Um, von Reckley-Hausen disease, for example. Von Reckley-Hausen disease is neurofibromatosis. Now, instead of me to learn Von Reckley-Hausen, Von Reckley-Hausen doesn't mean anything. I don't know what that means. It's better you say neurofibromatosis. That kind of gives you an idea into the disease you are specifically talking about so you want to know that the other thing you want to bear in mind is that diseases are uniform across all the systems diseases are uniform across all the systems we just change the nomenclature think of this if someone has low blood pressure heart failure for example and because of heart failure they have shock very low blood pressure or because of hypovolemic shock whatever the cause is for some reason somebody has extremely low blood pressure and blood is not going to all their organs hypoperfusion then what will happen 
if you're studying renal pathology, they're going to tell you that the patient had acute tubular necrosis or renal infarction. Right? Or renal infarction. That's what they're going to tell you. If you're studying gastroenterology, they are going to tell you that the patient has mesenteric ischemia. Right? In gastroenterology, they are going to say the patient has mesenteric ischemia. Now you think of it, it is exactly the same pathophysiology. There is decreased blood pressure resulting in hypoperfusion of the organs. So you don't have to be bamboozled every time you study different subjects. Just realize that, look, the same thing that is happening in this subject is the same thing that is happening across all the subjects. The difference is that we are naming things differently. And because the organs are different, they will often appear differently as well. If we have decreased blood flow to the brain, we call it a stroke. Whether usually, so this will be ischemic stroke. What's the difference between ischemic stroke and mesenteric ischemia? Nothing. Decreased blood flow, hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion is the cause of all of these things. They all share pathophysiology. Once you realize this, you realize the, the mystique of pathology is dissolved, right? Because you realize everything you are studying across these subjects is basically the same thing. So you don't have to be afraid of pathology. Just realize, as I studied for this system, if I understand it well, and you should try to understand it well, it's going to carry on across to the other subject. It's going to be tough at the beginning to understand the information, but as you learn more and more information, it's going to get easier and easier. If you expect that to happen, it will happen most of the time, and you'll find out that you become more fluid as you go through the subject. The third thing I'm going to tell you to pay attention to will be images. Images. Pay attention to histologic images. Some of you may say, oh, I was not good with histology. Sometimes it's good to know the normal before the abnormal, right? But it doesn't matter. Images, even if you did not study histology very well, now you are in pathology, you need to know what certain diseases look like when you see them. A wedge, in fact, what does it look like when you see it? The x-ray of someone with pneumothorax or a condition, what does it look like when you see it? This is very important. Whether these images are histologic, x-ray images, CTs, whatever the case is, you want to try to make sure that you know the histologies of the various disease processes. And the best time to know them is when you study that disease. One of the ways to make sure that you know it, some of you are going to say, oh, when I study, I looked at it, I saw the image of the granuloma in the book. Now, the one they gave me on the exam does not look like the granuloma in my book. You may have experienced that before, right? I, I've seen a granuloma before, I know what it's like. I saw it, in fact, I saw it in my Patoma book, I saw it in my first aid. But the one they gave us in the, in the, on the exam does not look like a granuloma. Okay, I'll tell you how you can deal with that. When you study a particular thing, right? So you, you look at the image of a granuloma in your first aid or in the Patoma book or in the Robbins book, depending on what you're doing. You want to go online and find that image. So if let's assume that the image we're interested in here is the granuloma, right? I'm going to go here and I'm going to type granuloma, right? granuloma i will say histology because i just want them to show me the images of a granuloma now i'm going to drag this so that you can see okay i have the images of a granuloma here i'll probably be moving my screen around a lot now look at this so this is one way that a granuloma can look right can you guys see i hope you guys can see i'll move my face as well Oops, 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 oops. Okay. I'll move my face out of the way. Okay. This is one way that a granuloma can look. Do you see that? That is a granuloma. It's probably the most obvious presentation of a granuloma. But this is also a granuloma. Right? We are not doing pathology, so I'm not going to start trying to teach you anything here. This is also a granuloma. 
This so when you read, if you studied your notes and you saw this classic image, this is the classic granuloma image in your book as you were studying, and you never saw the other different ways that a granuloma can look. On your exam, when they give you some of these non-typical granuloma presentations, you're, some of you are going to be like, I didn't know that that was a granuloma, but I know what a granuloma is supposed to look like. So, when you see images in your books or in your study resources, I want you to go online, look up that image, and see different ways that the same image can be presented. If you're able to do this, you will never be shocked. When they give you an image, you're not going to be surprised at the image they gave you, or you're not going to be wondering, oh my God, why is this looking like this and stuff like that. I hope that that makes sense. They're going to get back here. Okay, very good. So, you get the images, look up the images, try to know them. You do the same for x-rays. Some x-rays, you see them in your book. When you see them on the exam, you miss them, right? And also, the more you see the images, the more you remember, the better understanding and the better memory you make of those images. Finally, I've already given you sources for all of these things. Practice questions. Practice questions, practice questions, practice questions. Rereading is not a good idea. Okay? A lot of students think that if I read it, hundred times, then I'll be doing well. No. Rereading sounds good, but something better than rereading is practicing questions. It is better that you practice questions, fail the questions, look up the explanation and learn, than that you go back, sit down and passively reread the material. Okay? So in all of these, whether you are yet to start studying pathology, you are already studying pathology, or you are at the point where you're preparing for the US money. The resources may be slightly different, right? But at the end of the day, you want to read it once and practice questions 10 times. Practice questions is going to be practicing questions is going to be where you actually gain mastery of the subject. And one last thing for those of you preparing for the US money, do not practice pathology questions mixed before you have practiced them individually and mastered them. If you are studying for the USMLE, I have a student I'm currently teaching that just failed the USMLE and he told me, oh, he did you all, he did them mixed and all of that. Pretty smart guy because I'm talking to him now, I'm figuring out that this student is actually pretty smart. But he did things wrong. You must gain mastery first before you mix things up. If you're at the point where you prepare for the USMLE, don't just boot up your U-word and just pick 40 questions random. Don't do that. Don't do mixed blocks of questions. Practice questions system by system. Gastroenterology, cardiovascular, um, whatever, renal, and so on and so forth. Practice questions according to the systems first. And when you're done with that, you can practice the questions mixed together. I hope that this helps. Please remember to leave a like on the video. Remember to subscribe. Share this video to somebody that's going to find it helpful. And tell me which other subjects you want me to cover like this. You want me to show you how to study it, or what to do about it, how to go about it. And I will make a video promptly to help you in that regard. Until next time, I will see you guys soon. Keep studying. Become excellent in medicine. All the best.